Hi, my name is Patrick Curran, and along with Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. In this episode of Office Hours, I'm going to continue our discussion about the structural equation model by focusing on path analysis. In some disciplines, this is sometimes referred to as simultaneous equations or structural equations with observed variables. They all refer to the same general kind of modeling strategy. Now, to begin, I'm going to start to build a model using path diagrams. This is a strength of the SEM in that we can use a set of diagram notation that communicates the structure of our model. If they're drawn in a very specific way, they're actually isomorphic with the model equations. That is, if we draw a, a precise path diagram, it implies a set of equations, and equivalently, we can write out of a set of equations that imply a particular path diagram. Usually in practice, we don't draw them that precisely, and instead we use them to convey broader aspects of the model about what correlate with one another, what is regressed on different things. We'll see as we build this. So let's return to the hypothetical example I first introduced in the initial episode, which is studying children with an alcoholic parent. So what we're going to do is start with a variable denoted COA. So that stands for child of an alcoholic parent. Say in our hypothetical study, we do face-to-face -face interviews with the parents. We get a diagnostic DSM determination of abuse or dependence and alcoholism. And a child gets a value of zero if they do not have an alcoholic parent and one if one or both of their parents are alcoholic. All right, now let's say that we are interested in studying substance use in the adolescents. All right, so this is, we interview the adolescent now, and we say in the last 30 days, how many drinks of alcohol have you had? How many times have you had five or more drinks? How many times have you felt drunk? However it is that we're going to measure that. All right, and this is going to be our dependent variable. Notice both of these are in rectangles. All right. the, the notation that we're going to use in path diagrams is we're going to use a square or a rectangle for any variable that we observe directly. So you can think about your own data file is, is there a column that has numerical values on that measure? And if it does, that's called a manifest variable or an observed variable, and we're going to denote that with a square. When we get to latent factors in later episodes, we're going to uh, denote those with a circle to show that that's a latent factor. And in the path model, they're all manifest variables. So those are squares. Now next, we're going to use a single-headed arrow to denote a regression coefficient. So this is just like a multiple regression model. And it is regressing the dependent variable on the independent variable. So this is our usual uh, regression. This is sometimes called a directed effect because it goes from COA to substance use. and then. We're going to put an arrow like that to denote the residual variance. In the structural equation model, that's sometimes called the uh, disturbance in the equation. All that is is the part of the dependent variable that is not explained by the predictors. All right, so we have a regression coefficient, we have a residual variance or a disturbance. Now, this is a single predictor. This is binary grouping, a continuous outcome. So that's the equivalent of a t-test. But what we could do is begin to add variables on this side. So say we have the age of the adolescent, all right? So we can have another regression coefficient. But these are both predictor variables. In SEM, they're sometimes called exogenous variables, where dependent variables are called endogenous variables. Here, we're going to draw a double-headed curved arrow to denote that these two are correlated with one another. What that allows is we can estimate this regression coefficient to be the effect of COA on substance use above and beyond age, or controlling for age, and vice versa, age on substance use above and beyond COA. We can make those inferences because we're allowing these two variables to correlate with one another. Dan has a whole playlist uh, uh, of office hours on multiple regression, and so if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd recommend looking at those. All right, but let's say we want to continue to build our model. So we also have a measure of stress in the home. All right, so this is environmental stress that the child is exposed to. Let's say emotionality. So this is sometimes considered a, a biologically based predisposition to respond to the environment. So uh, people can range from highly emotional reactions to less so. And then negative affect. 
All right, and so negative affect is going to capture things like anxiety, depression, social withdrawal, things like that. All right, now each of these we can use to predict the outcome. All right, but because they're all exogenous here, we can correlate all of them. Now we could draw all of them with uh, the curved arrows. What you'll sometimes see in practice is someone will draw a straight arrow that is connected to each, and what it implies is that anything that shares that line covaries with everything else. And so we have our set of, of correlated predictors, a single outcome, and what you'll notice is this is a multiple regression model. All right, we have a set of five predictors, one outcome, we have two measures of association of the predictors with the outcome. The first is, what is the optimal linear combination of our set of predictors in the prediction of our dependent variable? And that's often captured in the multiple R squared. So you might see in a journal article where they say, the set of predictors accounted for 22% of the variance in the dependent variable. That's the joint contribution of our set of predictors in the prediction of our, our outcome. But then we also have unique predictability. So each of these regression coefficients is the effect of each predictor above and beyond all other predictors, or controlling for all other predictors. And so we can look at the effect of COA, controlling for age, stress, emotion, and negative affect, and so on. So this is a standard multiple regression. So we can see that we can describe that as a path diagram, but this is also a structural equation model. This is a form of path analysis that has five predictors and one outcome. But putting on my developmental psychopathologist hat, is this the model that I'm most interested in? And for my theoretical model and what I want to test, it's actually not is what this is saying is what is the relation of negative affect and substance use controlling for COA age stress emotionality, all right? What I'm really interested in is does the effect of COA on substance use, is that effect mediated by stress emotionality and negative affect? That is, do these variables, stress emotion and negative affect, mediate the effect of COA on substance use? Well, how would we restructure the model to allow us to test that? All right, well, what we're going to do is re-specify it. If you saw the first episode in this series, I talked about the six steps that are in, involved in most any SEM, and the first one is model specification. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to specify the model. Now, what's important is notice as I develop this model, we're using exactly the same measures, exactly the same sample, but we're reordering how the variables relate to one another. We're making a different statement about our hypotheses as a function of how we structure the, the model. So we're going to have COA and age as our two predictors. So we'll draw those in squares with a curved path all right, to denote the covariance. But let's rearrange it so we have stress here and emotion here, emotionality. We have negative affect, all right? Notice these are all exactly the same variables that we had before. But now, instead of looking at the unique effect of each one on substance use above and beyond all the others, we're imposing structure on their relations. This is the source of the term structural equation models. We're imposing a specific structure that is consistent with some theoretically derived research hypothesis that we have. So we believe that an alcoholic parent increases stress in the home, increased stress increases negative affect in the child, and higher levels of negative affect increase substance use in the child. Right? That this is a mediating mechanism. So there's a very famous paper by Barron and Kenny from 1986, and they lay out the definition of mediation and moderation. And mediation is a variable or multiple variables that explain the relation between a predictor and an outcome. And that's what we have here. Why is COA related to substance use? Because it affects stress and negative affect, and because it affects emotionality and negative affect. So there's some significant changes that we have here with respect to the multiple regression model, even though we're using exactly the same data and the same measures.
Instead of having a single dependent variable, we now have four dependent variables. This is also the source of the term simultaneous equation models, is there's an equation for every dependent variable, for stress, for emotionality, right? Negative affect is a function of stress and emotionality, and so on. So we have four dependent variables, we have structured the relations in these highly defined ways where COA leads to stress. Notice that single-headed arrow that leads to negative affect, that leads to substance use. All right, that's that structural part. But equally important is notice that we have fixed a number of these paths to zero, meaning that we haven't estimated them. We have said COA relates to substance use, but that has to pass through stress and negative affect or emotion and negative affect. COA does not directly affect negative affect. COA does not, lead to, not directly affect substance use. We've restricted the parameter space. Why is this an advantage? This becomes a testable hypothesis. The multiple regression is what's called saturated. And so all variables are associated with all other variables in the model. We've imposed no restrictions. All the predictors correlate with one another, and the dependent variable is regressed on all the predictors. So it's saturated, and there are no real restrictions imposed on the parameter space. Here, we're saying my theory lays out this particular structure, and I'm allowing the influences to go through certain pathways, but I'm not in others. And that is going to lead to what's called an over-identified model, and it's going to allow us to test whether this structure is consistent with the characteristics of the data that we observed. Now, in a later video, I'm going to talk um, solely about model fit, how do we use chi-square fit indices, things like that, to evaluate model fit. It's a very large and very contentious topic. For now, I just want to talk about, do we determine that a model fits well or doesn't fit well, and we'll defer the conversation to a later video. So let's say that we estimate this model, and we get a chi-square, and we get fit indices, and let's say that we determine that the model does not fit well. All right? And what that means is, is that we have a particular covariance and mean structure that we observed in the data, and we have a mean structure and covariance structure that is implied by this model, and those don't correspond well. So the model is not reproducing the characteristics of the data in a way that's adequate for us to say that we believe that we've identified the underlying uh, uh, etiological mechanism. So what do we do? We have two options available to us. One is to add parameters to the model in an a priori kind of way, where we look toward theory, we think about our hypotheses, and we say, all right, we omitted these particular parameters, I'm going to introduce them based on theory, and conduct what's called a likelihood ratio test, all right? So we're going to do a formal test of the inclusion of those parameters. So let's say that I add a direct effect of COA on negative affect, and I add a direct effect on substance use. We've added two parameters to the model, all right? So now it is still over-identified because we're um, holding some of these parameters to zero, right? Age doesn't predict negative affect, age doesn't predict substance use. But we've added two parameters to the model. So it's a little bit less parsimonious. Remember that one of our goals in any statistical modeling, but it's particularly so in the SEM, is we are trying to balance reproducing the characteristics of the sample data that we have to the best of our ability with doing that with as few parameters as possible. We could keep throwing parameters at this, and at some point it'll be just identified and fit the data perfectly, but we haven't learned anything because we don't have any restrictions, we haven't tested any hypotheses. So we've added two parameters, and it's a little bit less parsimonious. We've lost two degrees of freedom. We can take the chi-square for this test, this model. We can take the chi-square for the model that does not have the extra two parameters. We can take the difference between those two, and that difference is a formal test of the improvement in model fit with the inclusion of these two parameters. And so what we want to evaluate is, does adding these parameters significantly improve the fit of our model? If it does, then we would likely retain that expansion, those additional parameters. If it doesn't, we may decide to remove them. 
we might keep them, we might remove them. That's your decision as an analyst and as a theoretician. But we introduced these, and let's say that we did this and it did not significantly improve the fit of the model. And we say, all right, theory uh, suggested those would be there and they are not, and so we're going to remove them. Well, what do we do now? Well, the next option is something that is simultaneously very powerful and very cool, but it's also very dangerous. And that is to look to the characteristics of the data to tell us how the model wants to be modified. It is agnostic. It is atheoretical. It is based on derivatives of information matrices. And it is a complete data-driven process that would suggest how we want to modify our model. So you can see the dangerous part of it. We do this through these things called modification indices. They're also sometimes called Lagrange multipliers. And what they are is they're very similar to a likelihood ratio test, but it's done one parameter at a time, and it's done for all parameters that are removed from the model. So you get in your output, especially for more complicated models, you get this long list of modification indices that says, if you free this, your chi-square will go down by this much. If you free this, it'll go down by this much. This, 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 this. In complicated models, you can sometimes get dozens and dozens of these modification indices. But what we want to see is, well, is there one or a small number of parameters that if we were to add to the model would significantly improve the fit? Now, ideally, we would like those to be consistent with theory, right? We don't want to just throw nonsensical parameters. But let's say that there's a direct effect of COA on substance use and maybe a direct effect of age on substance use, okay? that it says if you add this parameter and then you add this parameter, you have a significant improvement in model fit. We might decide to include those in the model. And again, this is a very contentious topic. Uh, I feel both ways about this, as I feel that sometimes these modification indices can help us understand the characteristics of our data and how a complex model might be incorrect in some way. But also it's very, very dangerous in incorporating potentially idiosyncratic chance parameters that undermine our ability to replicate later, which is a very important issue in our field right now. So let's say, though, that we consult these modification indices, we add these, and now we have uh, an a adequately fitting model, a well-fitting model. So what do we do next? Well, first, we may stop here. And uh, you know, depending upon what your own goals and, and uh, motivations are, is we can say that I have a more subtly nuanced understanding of how these factors relate to one another over the multiple regression. You can start to see pretty quickly how the regression model is unsatisfying. Is I you know think going back is that effect of stress was what is the effect of stress on substance use above and beyond all other predictors? Here we have a very different insight about COA affecting stress that in turn affects negative affect. So we have some substantive interpretation, but we might also want to do a formal test of what's called mediation. All right, so I introduced that just a moment ago. And we know from many, many years of research that if we have significant links in a mediating chain, that is not sufficient to infer that the entire effect, the entire uh, uh, indirect effect is significant. What we have to do is test if the COA to stress to negative affect to substance use is as a unit significantly different than zero. This is sometimes called a specific indirect effect. That is, it's an indirect effect of COA to substance use that goes through stress and negative affect. Note that COA can also go to emotionality and negative affect and substance use. So we're only interested in this particular effect. Well, it's really straightforward in how we do this. We will literally take the product of these terms. So we have a coefficient for here and here and here. We literally just multiply them together. But then we need a standard error to conduct a z-test on that, a significance test. And there are many ways we can do this, is we could do it using something called the delta method. There's some more modern ways in which we use bootstrap standard errors. Any major SEM package incorporates these different kinds of tests. But what we might find is that when we test that indirect effect, that there is evidence that that is significantly different from zero. 
meaning that stress and negative affects significantly mediate the relation between COA and substance use. We could repeat that for the emotionality link, we could look at age, we could do a variety of things here, but that's an example of a mediated effect. Now notice that this might be considered uh, uh, partial mediation because we may have this mediated effect through stress, but there's also a direct effect, right? And so all that says is that above and beyond the mediated effect, there is still some influence of COA on substance use. And I personally kind of like following, uh, finding direct effects because it gives me something to write about in the discussion. You get a paragraph or two where you can say, well, what mediators might exist here to further explain that effect? Maybe it's parenting or social support or, or uh, uh, frustration tolerance or a variety of things that we might consider. So this is a very quick example of a basic path analysis. You can see the, the many kinds of things we can do with this. We can have more predictors, we can have more mediators, we can have more distal outcomes, we can expand it a variety of ways. We can estimate this using what's called a multiple group framework, where say we estimate it with males and females simultaneously, and we can equate parameters across the two groups and test moderation. And this gets us into something called moderated mediation. And what we might find is, does the stress negative affect pathway, is that significantly stronger for girls compared to boys? It's actually rather straightforward to do that in a multiple group setting. What's a limitation of this? Well, there are a number of assumptions that are made and I won't get into those now. The big one we have to pay attention to here is just like the multiple regression model, this assumes that all of the variables are measured without error. They are measured with perfect reliability. All right, so for some variables, we might be able to accept that assumption, right? Age to a varying degree, COA. But what about stress? What about negative affect, right? We're talking to a 12-year-old girl about anxiety, depression, social withdrawal, hopelessness, helplessness. It is unlikely that our scale score of negative affect is measured without error. Is we add up the items, divide by how many we have, there's gonna be some unreliability in that. What are the implications? Well, it can be shown, and Bolin in his 89 book really nicely shows this, that unreliability in a model like this, whether it be in a regression model or in a path analysis, it attenuates the regression coefficients. What that means is it makes them smaller. All right, and so an expression that we can write is the expected value of our sample estimate, meaning the long range average of that, is equal to the population reliability multiplied by the population regression coefficient. Well, what's the only way that the expected value of our sample estimate can equal beta? The population value is when rho equals 1.0. When rho is less than 1.0, this naturally begins to go down. So our expected value of beta hat if rho is 0.9 is 0.9 times beta, 0.8 times beta, 0.7. That's that attenuation, okay? And so it's pushing it down, and these regression coefficients are going to be smaller than they otherwise should be. A huge advantage of the SEM is that we can address that by saying, instead of adding up the number of items and taking the mean and assuming that that's perfectly reliable, we can estimate a latent factor. We can say, all right, we are gonna use the individual items that went into that scale as multiple indicators on a latent factor. We're gonna separate the residual variance, that unreliability, from the true variance, and if we meet our assumptions of the model, that's going to disattenuate that. This problem goes away, and the expected value of our beta hat is equal to the beta, so those regression coefficients are not pushed down. So in the next episode, I'm going to introduce latent factors and talk about how we can work those into the model, and then in the following one after that, of bring in latent variables within the full SEM. So that's been a whirlwind tour of the PATH model. I hope this has been of some use. And as always, thank you very much for your time.